All right. Welcome to another episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we want to welcome back a very special guest. We have Helen DeCruz, our first ever three-time guest. And as you may know, uh, Helen is a professor of philosophy and Danforth Chair of Philosophy at St. Louis University, who specializes in philosophy of religion, experimental philosophy, and philosophy of cognitive science. Her latest book, which she edited and illustrated, is called Philosophy Illustrated, 42 Thought Experiments to Broaden Your Mind. Welcome, Helen. Thank you, Alan and Leon. Hey, thank you so much for obviously being back. And so why I love this book so much and the sort of concept behind this book is so as a kind of therapist, right? A lot of times people think of therapy as just like, you know, you're kind of helping people through their problems and you're talking about or thinking about their problems specifically, right? So, but what I love about philosophy is that a lot of times you can actually infuse it into therapy as well. And you can infuse it into personal problems, you know, kind of Alan and I use philosophy in our own lives. Mm -hmm. So what I love is this idea that we're kind of bringing thought experiments to people as I'm going to assume this is sort of the idea, but I'll obviously ask, is that we're bringing thought experiments to people as a way to help them live their daily lives and make better decisions, right? And so can you tell us a little bit about the background, why particularly thought experiments, and even why you guys chose to illustrate them as well? Yeah. This, um, so this project started, I'd say about five years ago. Um, wow. When, yeah, five years ago, it takes a lot of time to conceptualize and, and draw 42 thought experiments. Um, so I have a background in art. In fact, my major was in art. Uh, it wasn't in philosophy. So wow. <laughs> I later did a PhD in philosophy and did a lot of uh, philosophy courses uh, as an undergrad. But uh, I've always been interested in art. And in fact, starting out, the reason that I chose that as an undergraduate was that I thought that art gives us a window on uh, the human condition. That I think that uh, pictures give us a kind of way to think through all sorts of issues we have, all sorts of questions that humans regularly grapple with. And it does it in a way that is sort of open-ended. Um, so I, I got the idea of illustrating uh, thought experiments by, by the thought that, you know, already people sort of draw things just on the, on the blackboard or on the whiteboard, like they, they write. So for example, suppose you teach the cobbler and the prince or the prince and the cobbler, which is a thought experiment by John Locke. Uh, and basically the thought is the following, like uh, what makes you, you? Mm -hmm. And you might say, maybe it's my body that makes me, me. But then the question is, but what if, if, you use body swapped like there's lots of movies somehow when i was growing up there were loads of movies about people swapping bodies right and the one that that Locke talks about is uh that uh, you have this prince who goes into the body of the cobbler uh is he still the same person and Locke seems to say yes he is the same person because uh he still has his memories his consciousness so he sees the continuity of consciousness and memories as something that constitutes personhood. And so you can draw stick figures on the board, which many philosophy professors do like cobbler, arrow, prince. Interestingly though, the cobbler's mind doesn't go into the prince's body, but this is like Locke. He was such a, <laughs> an elitist apparently. Um, but you could flesh it out and sort of think like, these aren't stick figures, these are actually, you know, you could, you could do a bit more and think about how am I going to choose to represent this thought experiment? Uh, and I found it very interesting. So I started doing it at the time I was on Facebook. Now I'm again not on Facebook. And I started showing these two, you know, philosophy friends. Uh, and they said, this is really cool. This is really interesting. And so over time, people got the idea that maybe this wasn't my original idea, to be totally honest, like maybe that you could do something more with this, like, you know, um, so that's, that's how the, that's how actually um, the project grew. I then made a post on Board Panda. I don't know if you know Board Panda, but it's this mm -hmm. weird sort of um, picture based blog like thing and i got a million views wow. on eight or so thought experiments like i have never had anything with a million views i don't know maybe your podcasts have a million views <laughs> <in this case. laughs> I mean, all the time all the time yeah all the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time. All but the time. i was certainly stunned i thought wow so many views uh, and also people started talking about these thought experiments so mm -hmm. 
that that also gave me the idea like I should work this into a book proposal and see wow. if anything more can be done. Mm -hmm. No, it's 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 incredible, right? Um, we we know people who, for example, um, promote or or sometimes they put out ideas. Let's say on TikTok, yes. or like as you say, uh, Board Panda, or let's say Imager or Instagram, and you never know. Sometimes something just really resonates with a mass of people, right. and then mm -hmm. uh, and it feels like um, I, I can see the angle here. Like uh, for example, it because it was illustrated. Right. Uh, uh, that that caught people's eye that was something they could resonate with and then to come up with a book that has that sort of concept to it is right. an incredible idea and, yeah. and what were you going to say oh no so it's interesting because like with thought uh, thought experiments right i think it's sort of um i don't want to get too into this because this is a little bit uh maybe too academic but getting into just the concept of dreaming right isn't it so that like the main theory of dreaming now is that essentially we have dreams to prepare for the world and you know we think about dreams in terms of like let's say creating hype you know we don't do this but our minds automatically do this where we create hypothetical scenarios in our minds right to kind of think through and plan like how we would respond to you know potential catastrophes and the same thing is argued like for play right when animals and babies and kids play with each other it's sort of like a way of preparing themselves for the real world so i wonder if why people hung on to this or latched on to this idea um and the concept on board panda is because for them it was a way for them to explore potentials of reality that they might not have thought of themselves hmm. that's interesting I think this is definitely part of it because many people were um, sort of commenting on the thought experiments themselves, which mm -hmm. they had never seen before. So, for example, one of the thought experiments is Ibn Sina's flying man or floating man, where mm -hmm. Ibn Sina is wondering whether the soul is the same as the body, something that people in his time, mm -hmm. uh, or whether rather whether the soul could exist independently of the body. So for Aristotle, for example, this isn't the case. So Aristotle, um, whom Ibn Sina is, is sort of, he's very much influenced by, by, by Aristotle. Uh, this isn't the case, but Ibn Sina has this thought experiment. Like imagine a man was created by God, completely, you know, perfectly shaped, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, he wouldn't be able to get any sensory input. Uh, he would be sort of floating in the air uh, he, he would even not, his fingers wouldn't be touching, so he would get no sensory input whatsoever. Like, would this person be able to affirm his own existence? Mm. And Ibn Sina says, yes, but you see, he's not aware of his body. So he must be aware of something else, and that something else must be his soul. Mm. And so you had lots of people who said, hmm, Ibn Sina is not really right. It's not because you, you don't think that you're your body that that isn't the case that you're your body and it's so interesting because that is exactly the kind of arguments against Ibn Sina that have been formulated so people sort of they got to thinking about this and I found it really interesting to see the discussion uh, arising from this and from other thought experiments. Yeah, and a thought experiment like that can actually start making you think of the concept of either being a ghost or being a spirit and, you know, the machine or whatever you want to, however you want to think about it. So I think a lot of times when people hold on to these kind of beliefs, like, you know, being a spirit or a ghost, and look, this is not to say, you know, or to bash on anybody's thinking, like, you know, obviously you can believe whatever you want, and I have no problem with that. But my thinking is that when we don't think of it too deeply, right, it's very easy to hang on to something like the soul because it's very intuitive, right? So if our intuition tells us like, well, it feels like I'm an I, like I'm a me, right? And it feels like my body is just, you know, in my possession. Like, you know, these are my hands, my fingers. Uh, this is my head, right? It just feels like I am something essential in the middle of it. So if you don't think about too deep, if you don't think about it, I think too deeply, it's easy just to say, well, the intuition tells me that I am a soul. So I must be able to exist outside of my body. It's yeah. And it's also like asking the question, you know, if I was missing an arm, would right. I still be me? If yeah. I, which is, yeah. Legs, mm -hmm. I had just yeah. my head. Yeah. You know, if my head was here and my body was there, right? where, where am I actually? Actually. True. Am yeah. I here or am I there? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Helen, is this what you saw uh, in kind of going through these thought experiments? Is this what's this the kind of major purpose of them um, as they kind of were articulated throughout history that essentially philosophers were, I guess, following in the traits of Socrates, right? Kind of getting people to see these truths on their own. So there's a continued discussion on what thought experiments do. So some people like Jennifer Nagel indeed argue that is what thought experiments do. Like, with a thought experiment, you can see the truth for yourself that doesn't seem obvious to you. Um, like, for example, take Peter Singer's Drowning Child. Uh, mm -hmm. So he has this idea like, imagine you walk to work and there's this child drowning in an undeep pond. 
should you go and help the child even though you would, um, you know, your clothes would get wet. Uh, and it seems obviously that you should, like you would be horrible, you'd be a psychopathic, heart, heartless person if you didn't. But he then says, look, there's actually no difference, no moral difference between that and helping people that you don't immediately see, but that you could help, uh, for example, with, you know, donating to charity. Um, so this argument has changed lots of people's ideas and lives. And, uh, you know, it makes a big impact whenever it's taught uh, in university courses. Um, and so, yeah, you could say definitely thought experiments could be like that, but there are also really great thought experiments that don't really have that clear of a conclusion and that are still really wonderful thought experiments. Mm. So one of them is Zhuangzi's butterfly dream. Like, mm. so you have Zhuangzi, he dreams he's a butterfly and he's saying like, am I a butterfly dreaming he's Zhuangzi or Zhuangzi being a butterfly? There mm. must be a difference between those things. Um, and people are still debating what that actually means. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not that there is, and therefore, therefore, this conclusion, that's just not the case. And there's lots of thought experiments that, that fall into that category. And I think they are equally valuable. So thought experiments that help us to think, like they don't have a clear set conclusion, but they are still important because they help us to think through some possibilities and ideas that normally we wouldn't think about in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, going back to Huang Tzu, uh, what are some conclusions that uh, people come to uh, when looking at that particular thought experiment? I'm familiar with actually learning about it in an Asian religions class mm. uh, many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I didn't know that there were several interpretations of it, actually. Yeah, so th the reason is, and I'm now going to go into the book to see exactly how it was translated. Let me just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, of Let course. me have a look at this, how it's formulated. Yeah, because um, I remember uh, reading uh, the ba basic, right, I, I forgot what is, I have the book here actually mm -hmm. in my bookshelf. Um, yeah, I forgot if uh, if we're having an argument and I believe myself to be right mm -hmm. uh, and I believe you to be wrong, then am I in fact right and you are wrong? Mm -hmm. And then and then he poses like the other side. Yeah. And then if neither of us are right and neither of us are wrong, then who is to say who is right and who... I forgot. How yeah, these it goes, are good but questions. It was yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. That's in chapter. That's also in book two. It's in the same book, in the same chapter as mm. the butterfly. And mm. it's it's interesting because it's the whole overall scope of that chapter is skepticism. So the phrasing is something like, he didn't know was it Joe who dreamt he was a butterfly or a, but a butterfly dreaming it was Joe. So mm. Joe is uh is the first name of uh of, of Zhuangzi. Uh, there must be a difference between Zhou and a butterfly. This is what we might call the transformation of things. Hmm. And that these last two sentences are very mysterious. So for that reason, um, so originally uh, when, I, when I shopped around this proposal, so I had, I, uh, some people thought, and originally even OUP thought, it would be good if I wrote all the, the stuff about it, you know, so like, Thought experiment, picture of thought experiment, re, uh, rewording of thought experiment, mm -hmm. and then a reflection on it, and then discussion questions. But I kind of felt like uh, there's so much expertise because there's so many different areas that mm -hmm. it would be better to have uh, an expert talk about it. And in this case, Julian Chung works on Chinese philosophy, is more knowledgeable about this than me. And so she wrote um, the reflection on, on the butterfly. Uh, and for each of these thought experiments, I have somebody who will, will say something and not like this is the interpretation of the thought experiment, but mm -hmm. rather this is a way to think through the thought experiment with an expert was the idea. Mm -hmm. No, it's great. Uh, I, I, when I was uh, looking at the book, uh, I saw the number of contributors. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great number of authors who contributed to the book. It's, it's very interesting. It's some names I recognize, like uh, Brian Van Norton, for yeah. example, yeah. and some other notable names, of mm -hmm. course. You know? Yeah. 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 So, so I, is it that you're saying that, um, just kind of for me to get an understanding and to think it through. So is it that you're saying, um, you know, to have it, uh, let's say presented by a particular scholar who, um, is it that the scholar would present like a nuanced perspective of it or different perspectives or what's, what's sort of the point of that? 
I just asked, I gave them the idea, like, just write about 700 to 1,000 words on this thought experiment in a way that helps people who have little background right. in philosophy, such as first-year students, to get an idea of, uh, you know, what the significance is and why this thought experiment is interesting. Uh, and to also uh, get them more to think about and to help them to think along with. So it's like you have some an expert holding your hand mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to see, to see the, the thought experiment in action. And it's kind of interesting, but I think for seven or eight of them, I was able to ask the original writer, the original wow. person who wrote, or writers, um, to write a reflection. Uh, it was funny, for instance, so you have David Chalmers and Andy Clark, mm -hmm. and they wrote in 1998, they wrote this very influential paper called The Extended Mind uh, in Analysis. And it has this, this thought experiment where you have this guy called Otto, and Otto is, lives in New York City, and he loves going to the MoMA, but unfortunately, he has Alzheimer's, so he needs to, uh, he has this notebook with facts and he opens the notebook because he totally forgot where the MoMA is. And I now totally forgot, is it 53rd Street? Mm. I think it might be 53rd Street. So he opens it and he says, oh yeah, the MoMA is there. And then he goes there. Then you have Inga and she is, um, she also lives in New York. She also wants to go to the MoMA, but she doesn't have Alzheimer's so she can easily find it by retrieving mm. the fact from her head. Mm. Now they say there is no functional difference between the notebook of Otto and the memory, the, the flesh and blood memory of Inga in her brain. So mm -hmm. these two are both thoughts. They're both beliefs, even though the one is in a book and the other one is in your mind. Mm -hmm. So that was their idea that the mind could be extended. Uh, and so now they reflect on this 20, 20 years after, which was or more than 20 years after, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's it is fascinating. I've actually heard, uh, I think he follows you. We were discussing this earlier, uh, Jason Silva. And uh, he has this um, program. He I don't know if he does it currently on YouTube, but it was called Shots of Awe. And one, it's like a few minutes, well edited video, and he'll um, he'll speak about philosophy and and maybe go on a sort of a like a rant. So at one point he started describing the extended mind thesis and how actually our phones uh, count as extended minds, mm -hmm. and that uh, in a sense that we're all kind of like. Uh, like uh, I forgot cyborgs or something like that, essentially mm -hmm. uh, walking around with these extended minds in our pockets, access to information all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a very interesting use of the extended mind thesis to sort of explain, you know, how how that works mm -hmm. and stuff. So yeah, it's yeah. interesting. And so what was the what was Chalmers' idea on that thought experiment? Was uh was his conclusion that we are extended minds that essentially some part of us exists out in the world? Yeah, as so well? so yeah. if anything, if anything, the, the thesis is even strengthened. They could not mm -hmm. foresee, as they were saying, you right. know, the fact that we'd all be walking around with phones. Now I personally think that because we can do anything with our phones, like you know, I can't play chess very well, but I can just use an engine. If you ask me what's the best move, I could do it. Like, does this mean that all of a sudden I, I am a better chess player? Like, so I might no, yeah. personally, because just because the phone is so wide, I actually think that the notebook is such a nice example in, in the original thought experiment because it's nice to self-stride. Whereas the phone gives me the worry of what critics of the, the extended mind have called ex cognitive bloat like mm. in the end you know it bloats it bloats too much uh, so that's just a personal worry and you see that's why it's good i asked Chalmers and clark to write about this uh, rather than me because otherwise you'd get an idiosyncratic mm. view on all these different thought experiments mm -hmm. can you tell us about his reflections was it that they were updated for obviously 2021 at this point yes yes so they they um off the top of my head um <laughs> Let me see. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they just update it to to the contemporary context. They think that it it uh, even more strengthens uh, their original argument. Um, they look at some some common responses and objections uh, to to the you know to the extended mind, such as the parity argument uh, that that you know that is functionally parity. There's functional parity, and therefore uh, it's right, the right. same. So they basically. 
Um, and they say that, you know, as, as technology develops, it's likely that our minds will keep on extending. And, and that's again where I think, hmm, are you very sure about that? Like, are we really, like at the same time, so there's this, this pull of intuitions. Like on the one hand, it seems like, oh, I know a lot about epidemiology. On the other hand, we know nothing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, unless you're, you're somebody who trained in epidemiology, do we, do we really know all that much? So I don't right. Yeah, and it's yeah. also interesting to think about, right? Because like, just because I have like, let's say a, a whole, I don't know, Wikipedia on my phone, right? But I've only read mm -hmm. maybe 0.01% of it. Does that necessarily mean I know everything that's on the Wikipedia just because I have a phone? No, just, but it is interesting that you have access to it right. at, your, at your whim. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, barring, you know, internet access being available or how quick. Mm -hmm. And also what but, if you don't understand the information? What about them? Is that part of your extended mind? That's fair. Yeah, you wouldn't understand mm -hmm. it, right? Right, okay, there right. You go. Right. Yeah. And then it's, mm -hmm. it, and it also with the uh, concept of the extended mind, I can also assume that people don't really have much of an incentive to memorize though either. Yeah. So it has interesting effects on our cognition, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can see in different times and different periods, like if you think at some point in history, in some traditions, like the ancient Vedic tradition in India, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, even Homeric Greece, there and the was Druids. this enormous... Yeah, there was this enormous emphasis on orally transmitted knowledge. Even if writing systems were available, people would not use it for that purpose and they would instead use the mind. So I'm imagining that scholars then would have enormous, you know, so it, it would change how you do things, right? Uh, I mean, I can only think, I can only say a few poems from memory. I don't know mm -hmm. about you guys. Uh, and all those poems I learned in, in high school and middle school. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, yeah, <clears throat> it has to change our cognition in some sense. Yeah, I'm only good at reciting Tupac songs. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> and I can't remember anything right now. <laughs> See, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting because like even here, like we have lists in front of us, right? If obviously like to jog our memories, but I don't know, man, I don't think I would consider this list as an extension of my mind. I would think of it more as like a booster, or, like maybe a support system, but to think that it's a part of my mind, I don't, I don't think I'd go that far. Sure. Yeah. A part of your mind. Sure. Oh, well, you know, there's, in, in terms of what technologies will be coming out, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know yet, uh, but let's say Neuralink, right? right. Uh, Elon Musk's invention. In the beginning, it's going to be used just to treat uh, brain diseases and uh, uh, neuromuscular sort of disorders and mm -hmm. things like that. Supposedly though, if it does become available for commercial use, the, and the purpose may be to either telepathically send messages to people or also quick not telepathic sorry techno 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 technopathically, technopathically. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 te yeah yeah technopathically and um and also yeah supposedly you would be able to bring information to your mind as mm. opposed to look using your hands to look it up on your phone uh somehow <laughs> god we're it. so lazy <laughs> yeah and it'd be interesting how that's going to work i don't even know if that will change how you learn the inform well it should change how it you learn to, it yeah but I don't know how that's going to factor in, whether that makes it easier for you to learn or mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then how can you tell us about some of the thought experiments that have to do with consciousness in the book? I mean, outside of the one with David Chalmers. Yeah. So there's there's various. Um, so let me think. There's the one on Mary in the black and white room by mm -hmm. um, by Frank Jackson. So marrying the black and white room is actually one of the first drawings that I did. And it's very simple. So it's very sort of stark in terms of like this three colors in the thought experiment. So you have this uh, Mary who uh, grows up in a black and white room and she learns from black and white books, etc. Uh, and she learns all about neuroscience and she becomes this brilliant neuroscientist. Now, according to uh, some physicalists, actually all our experience is reducible to um to brain states to you know or the way that our brain interacts with the environment and there is nothing over and above that but then it would seem that if mary learns about color perception that she wouldn't learn anything new if she saw new colors like blue red etc that she has never encountered before Mm -hmm. uh, but imagine now that she gets out of the out of the black and white room and she sees red for the first time, would she learn anything new? And uh, 
the intuition very strongly seems to be that yes, if she encountered all sorts of colors that she'd never seen before, she would learn something new. And that something new is not something you could capture in, you know, propositions about neural states. Mm-hmm. Um, so so that that's one. Uh, the other one, I already mentioned the um, uh, the prince and the, and the cobbler. There is also uh, Accidental You by Ruth Melikin. Mm-hmm. Who also drew the drawing? Uh, who also not drew the drawing? I drew the drawing, mm-hmm. but who also wrote the reflection on it? Uh, and it's 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 such an amazing thought experiment. Like it's totally wild. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, this thought experiment is better known as Swampman, mm-hmm. but Millikan came up with it. Um, so the idea is: imagine that you know, do some some really remote weird coincidence there would be a coalescence of molecules that would form exactly you like mm-hmm. your total double uh, even with the same your sort of neural connections everything oh, right. now with this person could you say that this person has thoughts and beliefs and Millikan's idea is that no mm-hmm. and that's interesting right yeah. because this person he'd have he wouldn't have the history that yeah. you have uh, and and hear her her intuitions because this fits with her idea about you know that for something to have certain intentional states it has to have a history the history actually gives it the fact that it that it is about something something can only be about something if it has that relevant history right, uh, right, right. but i do feel that intuition like it seems to me that if you know my perfect duplicates stood there, and you know, I think that this person would have thoughts if they were really like neurally exactly the same. I don't know. So here is again an, an interesting example of a thought experiment where um, it's just not clear what the answer is, but it's still interesting to think about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the feedback your duplicate would get is different in the sense that if. You, it couldn't it wouldn't occupy the same exact position let's say that you're occupying so i mean i suppose true oh that's good right? so, that's really yes mm-hmm. yes that's in, true. in that yeah. sense it would be different yeah but i, I would also intuitively think that if they are a exact duplicate of me if they if they had a duplicate of my brain wouldn't they have a i would think they have a duplicate of my memories but it's that's like, true you know, that could be yeah but yeah. except for but here's the thing though if they have a duplicate of your memory right but they're going forward in the future with you and then you are you and they're your duplicate uh, there's a split well, yeah there's now going to be different right. sorts of feedback right yeah that's going to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. color their experience yeah yeah, yeah i i remember just a quick anecdote i remember once uh when i was in therapy i was like uh, trying to get over this girl and so um i told my therapist i said yeah man like there's like no way in the world that this is going to happen <laughs> and so she tells me um uh as I was, you know I'm, I'm upset i'm like yeah you know like fucking sucks and you know so she's like yeah well you know what do you think of the multiverse interpretation of quantum mechanics i'm like okay where is this going and then i said yeah like you know i think there's a you know there's a like a plausibility there and a probability that it exists right and then she says well i mean how do you feel about the idea that somewhere in some universe you actually did end up with her i'm like no i don't like that that's not me that's some duplicate of me that exists in another universe i don't have those memories and those experiences i don't give a shit and then she's like well that was the best i got (laughs) that's neil seen on babu's um possible girls or something or possible girlfriends oh interesting yes yeah, yeah, he has a paper on that. Like, she mm. must have read that. That oh, would be an amazing coincidence. Interesting. Uh, what was it? Yeah. It's something called Possible Girlfriends. Mm-hmm. And the author is Neil Sinan Babu. Mm. So, yeah, uh, I, I think I think she must have read it. Uh, that and, down and, for later. No, just, and some yeah. people some people feel comfort in that but again it's interesting like you can entertain this thought experiment it's not in the book this one um and then wonder like do i feel confident that there is a really happy <laughs> me somewhere uh or or not 
Yeah, because it's like if we're talking about experiences and this, you know, going into the matrix, which is obviously coming out in like two weeks or whatever it is. Right. So the idea there is like if you're the one who's having the experiences, I mean, honestly, I don't know what does it really matter, like whether it's you or, you know, or it's someone else, but they're your experiences. Right. But what I'm saying just really quickly before you go on, just to tie it back into this, to say it's like that doppelganger is not having I'm not having his or her experiences. Right. So the way I kind of interpreted what my therapist said was like, it's it's a nice maybe comforter but the thing is number one it's not her in this other universe again it's a duplicate of her and number two or whatever i'm a duplicate of you know my of the other person i don't know who's duplicate but whatever it's a duplicate let's say of her and then it's a duplicate of me so therefore we're not having the same experiences so my thing is like uh i mean not to get too off topic i probably even shouldn't have mentioned the matrix but my point is that the experiences are the things that matter that's what i'm saying so like for me i would so i guess what i'm trying to say is i would rather have a matrix like existence than have the comfort of knowing that some other person who resembles me is having a better life than I am here. Like, fuck that guy. Interesting. It's interesting uh, that you bring up the matrix. I just want to say something briefly about it. So mm. many of us have been using the matrix like for a long time for teaching yeah. and that went well, but after a while people were wondering, what is this movie or what is this series of movies? We don't know. Like, and then, you know, we realized, oh my God, this is really old, right? But then, <laughs> you know, we are getting older. But now I'm actually happy to think that uh, our students are going to be back <laughs> on, yeah. on track with us. And that is important too with thought experiments like I think in a sense they give us a kind of canon like I know canon is sort of like uh, um, Zen right controversial. yeah yeah so the, so the idea is they give us like there are these kind of stories that we help we all think through that are shared right um, and and that help us to you know as a sort of shared vocabulary and as a sort of shared tools for thinking and I think this is something that's often not recognized enough as the power of a successful thought experiment. Mm -hmm. That is that people for centuries can think about the thought experiment, can add their own thoughts to it. If you think, for instance, about Mung's Child at the Well. So that's, that's the one that, was, uh, that had a reflection by Brian Van Norden. Mm -hmm. So you have this child. So Mung's says uh, basically that we all have... Uh, have a compassionate heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and why would you believe that? Because there was a big discussion and he wrote this in the fourth century BCE in China in the warring states period, when you had all these sort of warring factions and they would do terrible things. Like they, they, they'd enlist uh, the people the whole time and the big famines and epidemics. And it was really dreadful. So, so the idea, like there was this idea by Yang Zhu that um, we are selfish. Like that's, that's the main line. Like you just think about yourself and that ethics should be based on that. So that was ethical egoism. But Mungsa said, no, because imagine if you saw a child teetering at the edge of a well, you would feel a sense of alarm and compassion and you'd feel at least some urge to help the child, not because you thought, oh, I'm going to get the reward from the parents or the village will fed me about what a great hero I am, but genuinely out of a sense of compassion. And it's an interesting thought experiment because in the tradition, in the Chinese philosophy tradition, you see many people reiterating this thought experiment, adding to it, thinking more about it. Uh, and I think that is, that is powerful. If we can have these sort of shared stories to help us tr think through things. So Dan Dennett calls thought experiments intuition pumps, and they are that, but they're also shared intuition pumps. They're pumps that that you know we can learn you we can use in conversation i think that's important yeah, would you say kind of one of the main i mean i don't know i this might disagree with Dennett, but is one of the main kind of uh i guess aims or goals here is to use these thought experiments not to necessarily um kind of elicit our intuitions but also to overcome them i think definitely yeah yeah i think that that's definitely an aim of good thought experiments mm -hmm. is that they just make you think of things a little bit differently. Right. So I'm just trying to think of a really good, uh, good example here. Um, uh, would a koan count as a as a thought experiment? Like uh, we brought this up, like uh, like uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping, mm -hmm. right? And if you try to imagine that, all of a sudden your intuition 
you know, there's sort of a stop there. Yeah. yeah. At least for me, because mm-hmm. uh, you can't really imagine what one hand clapping sounds mm-hmm. like. You might imagine, let's say, let's say silence. Right, right, right. That's true. That's true. And, it could be like a version. And of it's it. more of like a Zen koan mm-hmm. slash thought experiment. Mm-hmm. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think Zen koans are actually quite close to at least how I see thought experiments, and they were really meant like that. So a Zen monk or nun in training would hear these uh, these koans, and the the one hand clapping is interesting because it is a real uh, Zen koan. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not a fake one. Uh, the first one is something like "What is the essence of a dog?" or something like that. I forgot. That that's what that's actually the most the one that the, the yeah. Buddhist monk or nun gets as the very first one. And there yeah. is no right answer with these. Yeah. So rather they look at how you go about answering the question. It's almost like the Oxford entrance exam to mm-hmm. see you know to see your thinking. Um, so I'm thinking in terms of what what Leon was earlier saying mm-hmm. that. Um, a thought experiment that helps you pull out of, of certain preconceptions is the veil by John Rawls. So mm-hmm. John Rawls has this idea that, you know, uh, how would you want to organize society? And it seems that we're so tied to our current situation. So, for example, you might say, hmm, I'm getting a bit on in years. Uh, let's make sure there's good pensions and security for the elderly. Uh, but if you're a young person, then you say, I guess, you know, those, <laughs> those people are just such a burden. And then, you know, why should we pay? So how do we, how do we think about that? Like, imagine that people were to decide together that they would just be dropped into this world. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what they would be. They don't know if they would be of the upper class, if they are classes. They wouldn't know if they were disabled. They wouldn't know if they were straight or gay. You know, that sort of thing. They wouldn't know anything about them, their gender unknown. Then you go about designing a society. I've, I've often sort of done this, like for my intro to ethics with my students, like, okay, sit together and there you are behind the veil of ignorance. Mm-hmm. And now try to reform British politics, like obviously, you know, like write down what, what you're going to do for the next, like not knowing where in British society you would end up because I do it internationally the way that that roles did. And it's very interesting uh, what they came up with. Um, so so I think that's definitely a thought experiment that helps us to push us out of our preconceptions and uh, uh, sort of like certain things that are difficult to get to get out of. Mm. And would you say the Rawls one is probably the most, uh, I guess, preeminent, uh, let's say, thought experiment in sort of ethics or I mean, maybe just legal ethics, but ethics in general, in terms of just, you know, philosophy in general? It's a very, very well-known uh, thought yeah. experiment. It was difficult to choose. Like I chose um, them based on whether they were drawable. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Like Descartes' demon, I love. But mm-hmm. honestly, 15 demons or so, and I thought this isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so it's not part of it, even though I do love Descartes. So that was the restriction. Like I felt that the drawing had to at least bring something, like a visual commentary to it mm-hmm. yeah and in, in terms of the ethical thought experiments which ones do you think outside of the veil of ignorance are the most powerful so the ones that i um that i used are the ones by mungsa singer then i have mm-hmm. Moses, impartial caretaker uh, then i have the experience machine by robert nozick uh which is a great discussion again mm-hmm. the, the experience machine is very interesting mm-hmm. uh, because uh, and then i have judith jarvis thompson's a violinist and people see it so about abortion so it's super uh topical, well, let's talk uh, let's talk about the experience machine yeah that one stuck out to me mm-hmm. too i was like what's the experience mm-hmm. machine? <laughs> so the experience machine is imagine that you uh, could choose to step to be plugged into a machine your brain would have electrodes and you'd be floating in a tank and you'd get nutrients so you just live out your biological life but in the meantime for all you know you would have the perfect life that you want Mm -hmm. so you would have to say like I want to be a famous writer so yes in the experience machine you are a famous writer or you know I just want to uh, live quietly on a farm with horses and again you'd have that like everything you want you'd have it you wouldn't Mm -hmm. know that you were plugged in should you plug in Mm -hmm. now Notic said obviously not nobody would want to be plugged in like and he uses this thought experiment to argue that 
there's more to life than just satisfying your hedonistic desires mm. that you want projects you want your life to have meaning and it wouldn't be if you were floating in a tank but i've had over the years students who said plug me in mm-hmm. it's very disturbing like i don't know maybe they they genuinely think that the simulated life would be better or that better like, i don't know <laughs> Uh, so, so that's uh, interesting. Arguably, we're running that experiment right now. Although, with uh, VR, right? I mean, you you could essentially you know that you are going into these experiences, but yeah, you can orchestrate. You know what's so, wow, and it's so interesting that you mentioned that. Yeah. So I was watching. Um, so Netflix has this new documentary out called "The American Meme," which mm. is literally about just like celebrities and social media, and like you know how people become influential and what are they called? Uh, well, influencers, right? Yeah. How essentially you become a celebrity by doing nothing, right, or just by being famous. So there was um a scene toward the end with Paris Hilton. So she's actually created like a virtual reality dance club, right? And she doesn't need this, right? This is a person who can go anywhere in the world. So it's interesting, right? So, but for her, because I I don't want to put words in her mouth but i think this was she what she was getting at is that like she said that she's kind of like really tired of just like being in clubs and being around people who don't really care about her as opposed to like her fans who really love her and she's like you know i interact with them every day so what she's done is she's created this virtual dance club right where she comes in yeah so she puts on the headset she enters in as a dj and then all of her fans from all around the world can just come and hang out with her in her dance club meaning that here's this club that she gets to fully control right and then on top of that she has virtual bouncers so if like a troll somehow makes it in here right the bouncer like kicks the troll out so literally she's created this club in i mean it's not necessarily just in her mind but you know it's an illusory thing that she's created this club virtually where she's like well you know my fans who like can't travel to ibiza or whatever right now they could just come and hang out with me and so for her she's like you know the fantasy is like intoxicating it's like phenomenal right she's like i get to do all of the same things that i would do in this club but i get to do with people who actually like care about me interesting isn't that wow yeah. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. Right. That's so interesting. There's a slight disanalogy with uh, with experience machine in that the fans are real. They're there right. virtually, but still real. Yeah. Uh, and I think David Chalmers is going to talk a lot about that. Like I haven't read his new book yet, but, you know, he says there's differences like you have Descartes demon or the experience machine where all the experience are fake. But right. then suppose you are in a simulation. You live in a simulation. Uh, well, the other agents suppose you're a simulated agent you're not like in the matrix that you're hooked up to a machine a real person but you're just like ones and zeros in a computer Mm -hmm. Uh, there's still a sense in which you genuinely have these experiences in a way because you're really interacting with other people even though they're other artificial agents free guy right how, how good was Free Guy? That was actually a really good movie, right? How like this non-playable character essentially. It, it, Helen, have you seen it? The Ryan Reynolds movie? No, no. It's, oh. People say it's great, yeah. It's actually, Alan, you tell us. You liked it. You, he loved it, so. <laughs> I liked it too, but like he loved it. Tell us about Ernest Beck. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, so, uh, free, yeah, so Free Guy was very interesting. So Ryan Reynolds is actually uh, a non-player character right. in the movie. However, he one day gets some sort of uh, semblance of of sentience. And then all of a sudden starts to experience the world differently than all these non-player characters. And then makes contact with someone who is a player and then becomes even more colored by that experience and more aware of themselves and wants to be real and and leave the world and have this life with this a character who's actually a player and yeah and it was a very interesting journey as far yeah as because wow. if we're thi- if we're thinking yeah. about simulation right like to her perspective so she is you know a real human being and then so like in her mind she's like wait like what's happening here like how is this guy in love with me right so for what i vaguely vaguely remember of the in the movie she kind of considered it right she was like um this is actually not that bad like here's this character who's not real i mean it's an npc right however you know he's clearly doing things for me he's trying to win me over he's showing real emotion right and this is actually kind of cool and what's interesting to me is that uh there are people right now who are actually attempting to create generally intelligent ai that just have ideas on their own in fact i think i saw an article i need to really look this up so please take this with a huge grain of salt Mm -hmm. um but yeah i saw this article where the very first living machine was born the other day supposedly that can reproduce that's something like that wow i need to look that up and get more info on that but that also was well to some people that may be disturbing uh i'll take it as interesting Mm -hmm. i don't i don't know what conclusion to draw right right but uh yeah we're we're going in a pretty interesting direction as far as technology goes oh yeah 
yeah, with AI, we were so long that nothing was happening and people were laughing about, haha, like you can't. But then, you know, one breakthrough after another. And now we're all on Wombo making pictures. Did you see that? The digital painting app. Oh, the like, NFT. Yeah, the NFT. NFT. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So wild. Yeah. And then there are going to be these virtual worlds. Oh, they actually already exist yeah. where you can hang your, or sorry, or you could put your NFT art in there. It's right. uniquely yours. And, it's it's crazy and this is only going to develop further so. yeah, yeah. yeah well i i mean just like in terms of like the matrix and people wanting to be plugged in or whatever right i mean even going like this is going back into the paris hilton example i mean you could kind of see that here's this person who has like everything a person could want and even still they're dissatisfied with reality so mm-hmm. i don't know it's like if a person would tell me hey you know what like i've seen the best of this world which paris hilton obviously has i mean she's obviously she's beautiful she's rich she has you know all of the sort of followers that one could want and she's like you know what this this kind of still sucks right i still want the virtual world and i could kind of then see why somebody or why there would be a good case for virtual reality right because here's this person who's at the peak of society and if it's not even good enough for them then how could it be good enough for the rest of us well just just i'll tag that a little bit uh even if she had all the what what if her experience was more of the material side of the world it was yeah right Mm -hmm. you don't know maybe maybe you go to another part of the world in, in spain let's say Maybe maybe you're not as affluent, but uh, you have less rules about when you need to be happy or right. what makes you happy. And maybe, you, you know, you enjoy dancing and, you know, and siestas and it's a very more of a simple sort of a lifestyle. Right, right, right. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, if you have some sort of control over your life to the point where you have all this money, yeah, of course, then there are less surprises, less less sort of uh, struggles or or you could control for struggles more fear also because you don't know who to trust at that point. and your world becomes right. predictable and the moment your world becomes predictable of course you're going to want to spice it up and yeah. have a virtual world or mm-hmm. play around yeah so i was thinking one the final thought experiment that i put in the book mm-hmm. is plato's allegory of the cave oh yes. brilliant and i was just thinking about it because i think that what happens with with people like Hilton, like what Plato would say is your eyes are not turned towards the right things, towards the goods, which is immaterial. So he said, he says, and the Neoplatonists would follow him in that, like what what people like Hilton would be doing is just staring at the reflections of the images on the walls. And it's never going to be satisfying because what is truly satisfying is to look at the real things, but the real things are immaterial. So thinking about this thought experiment for a long time, because if you Google Plato's cave, you will see dozens of images. And this was one of the things that made sometimes difficult to draw if so many people had already drawn it. But then eventually I was kind of thinking, uh, I don't know if you've ever read or saw the city of Amber. Uh, the mm-hmm. YA, YA story about mm-hmm. you know people who live in a dark city etc and I thought Plato's cave is completely a YA story right mm-hmm. it's about this young person who you know gets out of the situation and s- tries to save the other people even though the other people are then going to try to kill the person who gets out of the cave who mm-hmm. really sees it so realizing that I thought I have to do it in a comic style and you know that's that's what I, I made sort of like why a comic um, for Plato's Cave? Huh. Uh, and I think, you know, that that's that's one of the things that philosophy can really do because people like Plato, you know, they were affluent Greeks and they probably had the same thing about, you know, why am I not more satisfied? Why, why do I feel this lingering sense of, you know, fakeness? Uh, and Plato would say, well, that's because it is fake, right? You know, real things like, you know, the good, et cetera, are just immaterial and you you have to shift yourself to in order to see that you have to get out of the cave so in fact what paris hilton should do in plato's view is not to start a dancing but to go like live in a hut in the mountains or something you know something to clear her mind from all that sort of material fakeness Mm -hmm. but then the questions are what are these like immaterial values what are the goods what's worth pursuing yeah that that's a continued question so so some people like a Buddhist would say any attachment is bad. Mm-hmm. Even attachments to enlightenment is bad. And that's what, you know, the Zen koans that we talked about earlier should say. But other people who work in the Neoplatonist tradition, like Al-Kindi, he wrote this beautiful, uh, on the means to dispel sorrow. 
Uh, and he likens, I didn't put that one in the book, but it's very beautiful. So he likens, you're sitting on a boat, he says. So you're sitting, this is a ninth century Muslim philosopher, very wealthy, mm -hmm. come from a super wealthy family and his uh, patrons were super wealthy, etc. cetera. Yep. Uh, and he says, basically, if you are attached to material things, it's like you're sitting on this boat and you, you actually want to reach the destination, the shore. Um, but you're thinking that the stuff that, that you have to just survive on the boat is the important things. Whereas what's important is to get to the shore. So his idea is, well, it's just the afterlife. And that's the Christian sort of Neoplatonist inspired idea, like, you know, the afterlife. But I find that, you know, regardless of what your religious ideas might be, very dissatisfying, that this life is just like some sort of dress rehearsal for, for the afterlife. I find that super dissatisfying, like, uh, you know, maybe it's really great and the afterlife takes forever, which is super long. Um, All right. But I think it's more like a thing of, of value and beauty, um, you know, things that you can't necessarily own. In that respect, I think the NFTs are interesting, you know, the the, the sort of license, like there's this this wanting to own things. Yes, yes, like, yes. So you put, like, I, I was interested when they came out because I like making digital art precisely because it reproduced so well. Yeah, um, yeah. So you can you can you can easily sort of make digital art in, in so many. But I thought it was interesting that people found a way to nonetheless sort of put a stamp of ownership on it. Uh, so I think one of the sort of traditional Platonist answers is that it's immaterial things like like uh, you know beauty that you don't necessarily own and meaningful human relationships that you don't necessarily have uh, control over. Uh, and just you know things like that so so that's that's like this, this is not like deep original philosophy but i think that you know during the pandemic lots of people have realized this somehow that they want a quieter uh you know uh, gentler life that 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 is more meaningful uh, right. and many people have quit their jobs to look for meaning not so much for higher pay but but many people just think, look, I want to do something more meaningful with my life. So this is definitely something that is really very much alive now, I think. Right. And so I don't, do you want to? Yeah, so um, no, it, it's true. I mean, with, uh, with the uh, pandemic, uh, people, they kind of started to realize what what's important to them. Some people who are doing that nine to five job or, or whatever time, just to sort of get by, just to survive, um, who knows what they have been, may have been thinking, but when sort of faced with sort of an existential threat and not just themselves, but um, the sort of the world experiencing it at the same time, you start to really rethink, right. what do I do every single day? If, if I die tomorrow, would I be content with my, the way I was living my life today? Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, I know a lot of people who went through that. I, I uh, my best friend, uh, he left his job. He had a great job, a very high paying uh, great benefits, people there respected him, good team. Uh, but yeah, he wanted to change things up, right? It, he mm -hmm. realized that wasn't what was important to him. And yeah, and it satisfied all those needs. And right. sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. So, and then, you know, it made me think like in terms of like values and, you know, who we are as people. Uh, I don't remember exactly who said this. This was uh, some clergyman or some uh, some notable Christian philosopher slash maybe even Pope. Um, so he said something along the lines of like, you know, everything that's material can't be taken with you after you die, right? But the things that follow you are your deeds. And I've always loved that. And I've always hung on to that, sta that statement and comment. So what it means to me, because I'm obviously not religious, it's not so much about the fact that like, uh, let's say, you know, your deeds are going to be counted in heaven or, you know, that's what you're going to be judged on in some afterlife. I take that to mean that the facts of life are more important than the materials of life, right? So what I mean by that is that when you think about the things that we have, like, you know, this coffee cup, my phone, like all of these things are going to disintegrate someday. However, your deeds are always going to be facts of the universe, right? The character that you cultivate and the person you become, no matter how you become it and through what means, that's always going to be a fact of life or facts of life. So when I think about the things that we engage in, right? Like, let's say, 
say this podcast, right? Uh, so, you know, it takes us a long time to, you know, kind of put it together, to find guests, um, you know, to sort of to get better at interviewing, to become better thinkers, better speakers, right? So I don't think the podcast itself is as important as the sort of cult, the traits that we cultivate through it, right? So we cultivate like fortitude, we cultivate courageous, uh, courageous or courage, right? I was going to say courageous, that's so courage, right? We, uh, we cultivate persistence and diligence and all of these things, right? Whether we have the podcast or not, let's say tomorrow we decide, you know, we can't do this anymore. Podcast is over, right? And we move on to something else. So even though the podcast has disintegrated, like this coffee cup or this phone, right? Will it be able, not only are those, uh, not only are those traits like facts of life, but we'll able to kind of, uh, we'll be able to manifest them in other domains. So like, let's say if Alan decides, you know what, I'm going to go be a public speaker tomorrow. I don't want to do this podcast tomorrow. I don't want to do it anymore, right? I'm tomorrow, I'm going to go do this. What that I think essentially means is that these traits that I've cultivated from the podcast, even though again, it's disintegrated and, you know, I'm no longer attached to it. I can now use these traits elsewhere. So again, going back to that comment of taking his, the, you know, his deeds, but it, it's not, you know, uh, specific to any gender. The idea there is that the deeds that you take with you, not only again, are they facts of life, but these are the things that you could hold on to in the long term, as opposed to how you actually manifest them. Mm -hmm. So, well, <laughs> well yeah so that's what i think of when i think of plato and sort of like these values right because again i think that not nothing is like forever but the point of the values is essentially that the values are way more long term and if you kind of think of the Ak akashic records right that whole edgar casey idea i've always loved that even though obviously i don't think that any records exist but i do think in some way that's always going to be a fact of the universe so your deeds will always be a part of who you are even if again nobody remembers you and you don't even exist so. that akashic records bit is that um like basically another way of saying a collective unconscious or something or yeah yeah, yeah. so the idea is like um with the akashic mm -hmm. records that everything is stored in this like metaphysical library right mm -hmm. so it's like even though even though we've forgotten that atlantis existed right somewhere in these in metaphysical records right atlantis there's a story of atlantis and if we're able to access it somehow then we'll know right so i mean obviously i don't believe in anything metaphysical in this respect however i do think that like some part of us exists in the kind of like uh let's say the framework of facts right in the universe right Right. They look just like the Big Bang is a truth of the world, right? Us cultivating these values. It's always going to be a fact of the universe, honestly, even if the universe doesn't exist. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's really the only thing that we could hold on to. So, I mean, just in terms of thinking things through and thinking about what's important, I really, again, just going into and thinking about material stuff and, you know, Paris Hilton, the fact is that. Um, and so I do wonder this, uh, Helen, I'm, I'm going to ask you what you think about this. So with Paris Hilton, right, and this whole virtual reality thing, do you think that maybe there's a lack of confidence in actually creating or building something significant in the world that makes some of these people kind of run away from it in virtual reality? I don't know. I think it's a way to engage, like there is something escapist about it. And I right. think that for a long time, people have been suspicious of things that seem to give us escapist comfort, like novels, people, all the sorts of things you hear about virtual reality now, you know, right, they'd right. say about, about novels uh, centuries ago when the novel uh, first emerged, like it's, it's very interesting to see, to see some of the parallels, um, but it could be escapist. It could be a different way of engaging. Like I, I do like, you know, the sort of authentic, like, let's be in person stuff but at the same time you know lots of virtual panels I thought very interesting like I wouldn't be able to have attended them in person mm -hmm. uh you know and 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 we did do virtual meeting spaces and stuff like that uh, and I find it interesting because I'm part of a group philosophers for sustainability where mm -hmm. we want to try to keep at least some things online not everything online we're not saying everything should go online uh, and i'm doing an in-person event this summer so uh i'm organizing one but uh yeah. that we think because of this climate crisis and it's gone completely to the background but it is there that virtual reality does give us a carbon lower like it's not carbon neutral but it's carbon lower alternative uh that's also accessible to many people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm i more positive about it than I think many people are. I think we should give it a shot and we have seriously given it a shot now and I think we should continue to do so. Yeah, I actually, I really appreciate that perspective because yeah, a lot of people who I hear come at this uh, topic with fear and right. trepidation. They they think, oh no, the, the kids are ready. Everyone's on their phone. Mm -hmm. Then you add virtual reality and it's going to get better. And it's going to be a one-to-one -one, 
uh, sim like version. It's going to be just like our world, but you can do whatever you want and everyone's going to be in the matrix and yeah. never want to disconnect. And, you know, it's it's possible that some people may engage that way. But I mean, I get, like you said, your examples, uh, people thought the novel would be you know, the, the end, not the end of society, but people would. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, FYI, in, in ancient Greece, they really like hated Homer because they're like, he's going to just ruin all of our memories. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, nobody's going to want to memorize anything anymore because of him, because he's decided to write things down. There you go. But then, yeah, it's too, it's too fear-based. There's a lot of, it's, there's a tool and then there's the user of the tool. Right, right. And it's just the responsibility of the user of that tool to, be responsible i hear you right mm -hmm. so yep yep and then so before we wrap up helen um the i guess the final question which i think is the best and the most appropriate one to end the show on is what do you hope people take away from this book especially in context of um just the thought experiment in general so i'm hoping my hope with the book was that it was like a box of mental chocolates and it didn't mean that mm -hmm. in a in a sort of purely hedonistic sense, but I mean it also in a hedonistic sense, because I think philosophy should be, it is something that is, it is, it can be unsettling. So a lot of philosophy is super unsettling and, you know, students should come out of the classroom feeling disturbed. Mm. And, you know, <laughs> lots of that. people say it should be unsettling and we should have no safe spaces, etc. <laughs> but at the same time, I think that philosophy can also be comforting and fun. Mm -hmm. So, and I think with the drawings and short reflections and so on, that is something you can dip into. Like it's not this sort of deep, deep dive. It's more broad and wide ranging, mm -hmm. but that is also a way to engage in philosophy. Like you can just open the book and just look at any sort of thing. Like maybe a picture catches your eye and you're thinking, hmm, what could this be? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm hoping lots of non-philosophers will buy this. Uh, and, you know, with, with OUP, we agreed to like a price that would make it possible for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for people who don't have enormous budgets to, to still buy it, uh, that they, they sort of dive into this one thing that they're really interested in and, and look at, and then they can look at something else. So it's like a sort of sampler just to sort of get you out of the rut of your everyday life. And to maybe make you think of something that you normally wouldn't think about, mm -hmm. but that is still interesting to think about. So that that's what one of the things I hope that people will do with this book. But I have no idea uh, what what they will do. I could I could see the headline right now. Helen De Cruz says she wants to disturb her students. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 All right. So obviously, um, Helen. Thank you so much for coming on. You are legit one of the most fascinating people we ever get a chance to speak it's to. It's always so, it's just a pleasure. It's just, it's a, yeah. it's a flowy conversation. I didn't even notice the time. Right. And apparently, yeah, yeah. Wow. Time flew. We've got it over an go. hour. Yeah. So like, seriously, yeah. every single, every single time we talk to you, it's so fascinating. And you are legit. Thank you so one, much. One of our favorite philosophers and just thinkers, academics, everything in general that you could kind of put into that bubble. You're that for us. Yes. Oh, and, and thank you, wanted, you so much, both. Absolutely. And, and um, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, uh, where could we find you? So the best would probably be Twitter, which is uh, at Helen Reflects. Awesome. Uh, wait, actually, yeah, plug your website too, because that's pretty, uh, that's gotten pretty popular too over the past year. So HelenDeCruz.net. Yeah. Uh, that's just my personal homepage. And I've just updated it since, uh, you know, I, I regularly update this. Awesome. All right. Oh, and also, where can we find the book? The book is findable in lots of places. So Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, uh, you know, all sorts of independent bookshops. Uh, OUP's website has it. Um, so you can order it there. Absolutely. And we're going to, of course, include yeah. a link in our description, of yeah. course. All right, Helen, thank you so much. We'll be in touch with you thank soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. See ya. Wow. Yeah, it's always it's always nice Epic. to talk with her. Epic. I love how we got into the Matrix. We got into virtual reality, mm -hmm. extended mind thesis, Huang Tzu. I was like, Huang Tzu. <laughs> but anyway, uh, guys, if you uh, like to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. <laughs> and thank you so much for watching. See you next time.